I've come back to introduce um, an activist, an educator, and a protester who you have probably seen um, in your smartphones, perhaps on your television, very often wearing the same blue vest that he's wearing right now. Um, so I'll bring out right now uh, Dory McKesson. <laughs> I always look so mean in these photos. <laughs> oh, I'm really not that mad, I promise. So August 16th, 2014, I was sitting on my couch in Minneapolis. And I was, it's a good place. <laughs> and I was looking at my phone and then I was looking at TV and I was seeing what was happening in Ferguson unfold. And what I saw on Twitter did not match what I saw on TV. And it was that dissonance that said, I wanna go. I wanna be there myself and I wanna bear witness to what's happening. I got in my car, I drove nine hours, I ended up in St. Louis. I put on Facebook that I'm going. I don't know anybody in the state of Missouri. I hope that I can find somebody who knows somebody whose couch I can sleep on. And that was real. So I get to St. Louis, I meet Brittany, I meet Netta, uh, so many people that are now some of my closest friends. But uh, in those early days, I knew no one. I stood in the middle of the street like so many people. But I went, importantly, just to understand what was happening. I packed uh, three t-shirts, four pair of underwear, one pair of socks. I was like, I'm gonna be here for the weekend. And in the second night that I was in St. Louis was the first night of the curfew, if you remember back in those early days in protest. And it was the first night that I got tear gas. And it was in that moment that I said, I will do whatever I can to make sure this is not a world that people ever have to experience. That we shouldn't have to know the difference between tear gas and pepper balls and LRAD and smoke bombs, but that was real for us. And before that, all of my work had been around kids. It had been around children, youth, and families. I was a teacher, opened up after school programs. Like, that was my work. But I had this moment in the midst of the street in Ferguson where I knew that you have to be alive to learn, that I'm doing all of this work to make sure that kids have great teachers every day. But Mike Brown will never have a college professor. Tamir Rice will never know a high school teacher. That my work in that moment changed. And when I think about the last 20 months, I worry sometimes that people think about protesters as only those of us who stood in streets, as only those of us who got tear gassed or no smoke bombs or who directly confronted the police. But what I know to be true is that protest at its root is this idea of telling the truth in public. And that we told the truth in public with our bodies, that Mike should be alive, that Rakia should be alive, that Ayana, Tamir, that Maya should be alive. We disrupted board meetings and commissions to tell the truth that they weren't using their institutional power in ways that benefited the lives of black people and other marginalized people. And the act of truth telling is something that many people can do. That you don't have to be in the street to be a truth teller. We see right now that there are members of Congress sitting on the floor to tell the truth about a country that will not acknowledge the crisis of gun violence. And what we know to be true about truth-telling is that at the heart of it, it's about stories. That stories are the currency of ideas, and ideas matter because ideas shape the way that we act in the world. And what the movement, I think, did so well is that we told this story about safety that didn't center the police. We know that the safety of our communities is predicated on more than the presence of police. If I ask you where you feel the most safe, it's probably not in a room full of police. That you would probably say it's a room where there's family, where there's food and shelter, where there are people who care about you. And then the question for us becomes, how do we scale that? How do we make sure whatever your answer to that question is, is something that everybody can access? And as people of color, we've often faced these issues of erasure when we think about storytelling. And erasure often manifests in two ways. One is that either the story is never told or is told by everybody but us. And when we think about August, September, October 2014, we became the unerased. We became our own storytellers. And when we think about social media, it allowed us to tell stories and build community in ways that we had never imagined before. That we could tweet and we could mobilize 2,000 people. That we could tweet and we could build community. We could meet people who became real friends in protest. And that was really powerful. What we also know to be true is that the act of truth telling is the first step in the work. It is not the entire process. That people aren't born woke, something wakes them up. And that is what's powerful about storytelling. And Twitter, for us, was that thing. I'll never criticize people when they call them social media activists or, or whatever. 
um, phrase people do to malign the work of people telling the truth, because I know that truth telling is a, is a radical act, especially for marginalized people. And Twitter became that for us. And not only are we not born woke, but something wakes us up. There's a real difference between being woke and staying woke. And so much of this work is how do we make sure people understand the work at every step of the way? That there are some things around police that people really get today, but there are some things around the trans community that people don't understand. That this has to be about making sure people are woke at every step of the way. And it is stories that help us do that. But stories we know are not always enough. That changing the conversation is the beginning of the work, but the end of the work has to be about changing structures and systems in ways that demonstrably make people's lives better. That has to be it. That if all we do is change the way people talk about the world and not actually change the way people act in the world, that we've actually not done the work. And it is as much about hearts and minds as it's about laws and policies, as it's about structures and systems. And that what we do after we change the conversation, it is organizing. And organizing is not a mystical, magical thing. Organizing at its root is me saying, is you saying, I know the world can be better. Here's how I think it can be better. And let me find people who believe that too. That that is what organizing is. You don't need a mystical call from the ancestors. You don't need to read 15 books about it. We didn't know what we were doing when we were out there in the street, but we knew that we were not gonna go home. And then when I think about protests, this idea of telling the truth in public, it is often a last resort for people. When people get mad at the protesters, I tell them, people shouldn't have to protest. You wouldn't be mad about anything that happened in anybody's street if people felt like they could have called or they could have emailed or they could have gone to the meetings. But we were in the streets because we tried all of those things and we had no other option. And that protest is often about making the conversation unavoidable. It's about helping people understand that it is urgent. And it is about being really clear about a shared set of commitments, that we are using our bodies to tell you that we believe these things together. The next part of the work, though, is about organizing. It's about making sure that people understand that, that how we change systems and structures is about building a different type of power. It's about having people come together and use their time, talent, and treasure to force systems and structures to change. It's about city council members. It's about making sure that we are as organized on the inside as we are on the outside, that an outside-only strategy is not a strategy to win. But we have to be the people on boards and commissions. We have to be the people who are mayors and city councilmen. We have to be the legislators, too. And when I think about another thing that comes next, it is our ability to build coalitions. Can we create entrances to the movement for people who might not have the same goals, but have the same outcomes? You think about the gun control lobby. We don't have the same goals, but we all want to live in a world where there are not mass shootings. You think about the environmentalists. We don't have the same goals. We want to live in a world where there's not dirty water like in Flint. And that's how we have to think about what comes next in the work. I do have many worries about the movement space. I worry sometimes that people are more addicted to fighting than winning. That there is something about the struggle that becomes so rooted in people's identity that that becomes more exciting to them than the thought of a better world. I also worry sometimes that we think about the authenticity of those who protest or who are activists by their proximity to trauma and not their proximity to the work. And I, and I say that as somebody who both of my parents were drug addicts, my father raised us, my mother left when I was three. I know what it's like to sleep on the floor when the gunshots get too close. And that doesn't necessarily make me a better organizer. It could just make me a more traumatized person. That my proximity to the trauma isn't what gives me skills necessarily, it is our proximity to the work. And we have to make sure that we create space where everybody can do work because we will never get free alone. And that doesn't mean that we have to sacrifice this focus on blackness. That blackness in this country has always been treated a different way. We know that the privileging of whiteness and whiteness itself has created such a cast over this country that we have to talk about it in public. But we also know that we can't win alone. That the coalition building has to be an explicit part of what we do next. They have to be really concrete about the things that people can do. And most importantly, we have to remind people that they don't need permission, that you already have permission to do this work. Nobody told us how to do anything we did in Ferguson or in Baltimore or in Minneapolis. We did what we thought was right, and some things worked and some things didn't, but we tried. 
And what we did do over the last 20 months is change the conversation in the country that more people are talking about and understand uh, criminal justice, definitely issues about the police than they did before. I didn't know that the police have killed nearly three people every day in 2016. The police killed someone every day but 18 days in 2015 in every state in the country. I didn't know that before the movement began. I didn't know the story of Tamir. I didn't know about Ayanna Jones or Maya Hall. And now so many people do, and those are the stories that matter for people. And now the question for the movement is how do we take that energy and those stories and translate that into systemic change? And it is often at the local level. It's about cities and it's about states because that's where people feel the change today and tomorrow. And in the movement space, there is a schism sometimes around the reformists versus the revolutionaries. That's how people pose it. And what I tell people is that reform is this idea that we, can, we need to focus on the todays and tomorrows, that people want to get out of jail today and tomorrow, that they are not waiting for the 3,000 year solution that is abolition for some people, that they want to deal with it today. And that doesn't mean that we don't focus on the long-term changes like decoupling capitalism or, or abolition, that we can actually do both and at the same time. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited for the conversation. And what I know to be true is that we are only beginning the work, that the movement is young and that everybody has a role to play, that you don't need permission, that you already are enough and have enough to do this work to change the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions on that? No. Oh, so Mr. Like questions yeah, Mr. Technology that? here is mystified by the fact that you can send it. questions in, and I but can see, gotta them see this on the you, iPad. You can't see it, but it's super cool. This interface. <laughs> so, if you guys would keep sending your questions and via the social Q and A, but I'll start. I mean, one thing you talked about is you, you said you know, one of your last points was that you said the movement is not dead. Um, it's been 22 months since I first met you in Ferguson, Missouri, since you joined the protest. Um, in that time, there's been countless uh, anecdotes of people killed by the police, uh, robust conversation about reform or about change to laws. 22 months later, as we approach the second anniversary of the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, how would you assess the state of the protest movement? Uh, wh among, um, what would you list among the victories of the protest movement? And, and what do you think are the goals still moving forward? Yep, so I think about the movement in four buckets. I think about the first was about acknowledgement. We were trying to help people understand this is a crisis all across the country. And that took us about nine, ten months. So at the beginning, people were like, okay, Ferguson, there's a real problem in Ferguson. St. Louis, there's a real problem in St. Louis. They weren't like there's a real problem across the country. So it wasn't until the death of Sandra, Bl Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, that people were like, okay, something is like wrong everywhere. And that took us a long time. I think about the second phase of the movement is around solutions. Like people had to believe that there were real things that we could do. So you think about body cameras, you think about independent investigators. Like I think we did that well. The third part is around institutionalizing. So at the local, state, and federal level. And the fourth is around protecting the change once we make it. When you think about the Voting Rights Act, it's a great example of the protect phase is where they are losing. So they got the institutionalized change, but the protect didn't happen. Um, when I think about what are some of the successes, uh, the fact that we are having a national conversation about police um, and justice is huge, like that didn't exist before. And even I think about the success today, the fact that Congressman uh, John Lewis and other congressmen are sitting on the floor of the House is something that I don't think would have happened if it were not for the movement. And we've seen laws come up across the country. I will be transparent. I think that some of the laws came up quicker than the movement was able to adjust for. So you look at some of the body camera laws in places like DC, where the officers can actually get access to the footage before they write the police report, right? Which doesn't make sense to us in the movement. We think that is a bad piece of legislation. Um, but again, people are talking about solutions in ways that they've not before. I'm also mindful that we won't undo, you know, 400 years of oppression in 400 days, right? That this is like slow, methodical work and it'll require people to continue building community, which I think they've done. So, so someone asked, is your movement or is the protest movement interested in working with law enforcement directly to affect positive change? How, how, would, you, uh, how, how would you address that? Would you, can you talk about some of the work perhaps you and some of the other groups have done with law enforcement? And also, how would you respond to the frequent criticism that you and many others receive that you guys are all just anti-cop? Yeah, so the thing is, I would ask the law enforcement community if they are willing to work with the movement, right? So I think about the police union contract, the police unions have probably been the least reflective group since the protests began and have not necessarily acknowledged that there is a cultural problem in policing, that we are not saying all police are bad. We are saying that there's a system that's broken. 
And when we think about what it means that people can kill unarmed citizens and just not be held accountable, that we should actually all sit at the table and talk about how to change that. And we've not seen the police actually be reflective in that sense, and I think that is really disappointing. Um, there are some chiefs around the country who off the record will say like, you know, we should change some things, but we want them to, again, tell the truth in public, and we've not seen that happen. The White House has been really responsive around putting pressure on local police departments and, and helping to usher in some change there. They're doing some innovative work around body cameras, and, and we are working with them to potentially see if they can be a model around some of the federal agencies that can be used at the local level. Uh, but so much of this is local work. Mm -hmm. so, someone else asked, um, he asked, you know, how do I as a white man um, approach African Americans a way in, in a way in which they know that I want to listen um, instead of being hated as a response to something someone else has done? So, so how, how, I guess, I guess this speaks to the idea of allyship and, and people who are not black themselves but who would like to be involved in this, uh, in this movement that has largely placed its onus on the value of black life. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, you know, important thing about allyship is that it's an invitation, not a self-appointment, right? That what it means to be an ally is you are standing in concert with people who have said, here's what we think the work is and here's the role that you can play, uh, as opposed to people coming in saying, like, this is exactly what I'm going to do, right? And I think a lot of people come into spaces with the best of intentions and say, like, here is the work I'm going to do without ever asking a question about what is the work that you want to be done. And I think that that is the entrance. We think about what does it mean that people have privilege, it's, can you use that privilege to disrupt the privilege? So whether that is about resources, you know, I think people, people will say things that are, uh, about race around white people that they would never say around me, and, which is good for them. <laughs> <laughs> it is also important that the people they do say it around like, will hold them accountable, that the act of truth telling has to happen in the private and public spaces. So, this is an onus on you about this, the stories that you allowed to be told around you. Like, how do you use your resources, whether it's time or access or energy? Uh, there's work to be done at all levels there. But again, allyship, it's about standing with people and saying, what do you need? What do you think should be done? And what's my role? And starting from there as a point, as opposed to saying, like, here's what I'm going to do and take it. So I guess I guess the other question here is how do you continue to uh, build momentum uh, with this worry that people become numb to protest? This idea that the, you know, the police in the United States of America, at least by the Washington Post's account, are still shooting and killing three people a day. Um, that's no different. That, I mean, that's in fact a little bit up from the rates of last year. Um, but we're not seeing necessarily you know, the person who was killed yesterday's name is probably not trending right now on Twitter. How do you continue to keep up momentum in a world where there are distractions, where Donald Trump is saying whatever Donald Trump said today, where a lot of the lefty momentum is built into Bernie Sanders and maybe not into tweeting Sandra Bland's name? How do you maintain uh, that type of uh, I guess, excitement and energy. Yeah, so I don't think people are numb to it. I just think that we're in a different phase of the movement. That there was a time when we stood in streets that people, this issue of police violence was new to people. That people hadn't ever had a conversation about somebody dying in police custody. That, that like, the language wasn't there. That people mm -hmm. hadn't seen a video like Walter Scott before. And I think that people have largely accepted that there's a crisis. I think that there are more people who are hungry for the what's next, right? Yeah. They've accepted the crisis and they're like, well, what do we do about it? And I think that that's where like most people are. And then the question becomes for the movement, like how do we actually respond to that? I think there are two things. One is there are more people who I think want to do good work than know what to do. And there are more people that want to do good work than want to be members. Like I think there are a lot of people, who, if we said be a member of something, they'd be like, eh, I don't really know. But if we said, will you do these three things? They'd be like, yes, right? So then the question is like, how do we organize those people? How do we build an infrastructure that allows people to do really good work uh, with those two things being true? And I think that we're trying to figure it out. Uh, and again, mindful that the movement is still young. So, so what are your thoughts about these instances in which, and this happened uh, on several nights in St. Louis, it happened once or twice in Baltimore and some other places. What, someone asked, what are your thoughts about when protests turn violent and how that potentially impacts, when you have this mass number of people, how that potentially impacts the either economic condition of, of the space, where in the safety condition, the threat to potential officers, um, and, and kind of what, what are your thoughts on that? I know it's something you, you've certainly been asked before and have, have spoken out about before. Yes, yeah, so I tell people, if you're frustrated about Ferguson and Baltimore, you should also be frustrated about the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution, right? Um, that, like, at the end of the day, people shouldn't have to protest, that people should not have had to be in the middle of the street to be heard or to be seen or to be valued. Uh, and I don't have to condone it to understand it. Right? Like, I, I get why people made the choices they did. Um, so that's my response to that. There is this really interesting article that came out in the New Inquiry called um, the, the Benefits of Looting. 
Was yeah, well, 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 yeah, that's uh, the looting article that Republicans always get mad that you have they, them read at Harvard. They, Yale. It was Yale. Yale. There we go. Yeah. Um, but there's this interesting... In defense of looting. In defense of looting, of the, yes. Which I would encourage everybody to read, whether you agree with the author or not, because what he essentially says is that property is rooted in the psyche of America, and that if the QT in Ferguson had not burned, people would not have talked about the crisis in the same way, which I think is like an interesting approach to it. But so, again, I, yeah. I don't have to condone it to understand it. So someone else asked, they said, you know, how many police have been killed in 2016? Um, and so this is one of the reasons I've been fiddling because I can answer that question, right? So 19 police officers have been f feloniously shot and killed so far in 2016. Um, as of last night, 455 uh, American citizens have been shot and killed by police officers. I know that's a question I get very often as someone who writes about this. You know, very often when we talk about the work that we're doing to chronicle how many people are killed by the police, people shoot back. Well, how many officers have been killed in that type of thing? What do you think about that type of reframe? I mean, I guess it goes back to the question or conversation we were having earlier about whether or not these conversations can be framed in a way um, so they're not seen as anti-police. Um, but do you think that matters? And do you think there's a false equivalency there? Yeah, so this is one of the safest years for police in recorded history. So that is real. Um, the police are not under siege, and we don't believe in like the Ferguson effect, this idea that if you hold the police more accountable, all of a sudden communities aren't safe. Like We think that that, is, that makes no sense. The other thing that a lot of people don't know is that any data you've ever seen about police violence, right, like people being killed by the police, that the source for it is newspaper clippings. Like people often think there, there's, that is the source. So if you get killed in America and nobody writes about it, like it is not in our data sets. That is wild. So we think that even though we are able to talk about the crisis in a really public way, that we are undercounting at a gross level. Because if you get killed, there is no national reporting, there's no state reporting, that this is literally newspaper clipping. So we think about killed by police and fatal encounters, which are the two prime databases. The Washington Post has a database and The Guardian. They are still either by reports in communities or newspaper clippings. Like, that is wild. So we think that we're undercounting the number of uh, deaths by police. Mm -hmm. And so to, to wrap up, I'll, I'll do one more question. And the question is, how can we build trust between marginalized communities and institutions? And as uh, and I think that applies, obviously, to the police. It applies to, we've, we've had conversations about Congress and work being done there. Um, I'm a member of one of those institutions, the media. And I know that the media has certainly has played a role. How, do, um, how can that trust be formed? Yeah, I think that some of it is about accountability. So I think that one of the hard things about the police is that when they commit crimes, they are just not held accountable. And it's hard to trust an institution that won't hold its own people accountable, but hold everybody else accountable. So you think about, we, you know, we created the first public database of police union contracts in the country. And you look at some of these contracts and officers can only be interrogated in 30 minute chunks, hour chunks, like things like that that no other private citizen ever gets afforded. And we don't think those things are fair. Um, and I think that it starts with like this sense of accountability. So one person asked, uh, can we be friends? And so that's a pretty good segue to ending this and, and asking, how can people reach you? Um, where should they look for you? What are you, what are you plugging right now? Um, and how can people connect with you further to talk about this more? Yep, so I'm on Twitter. My name is DeRay, D-E-R-A-Y. That's my Twitter handle. And joincampaignzero.org is the platform that shows you the 10 buckets we have about how to end police violence and where the data sets are. It's been great to be here today. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.